to be a successful VC back company, you basically need to go public or have like an insane acquisition or exit, you know, in the billion dollar range, right? Because that's what those investors need to make their business model make sense. Since, you know, 95% of their portfolio companies are probably not going to make it. Or are they going to have like kind of like a acquisition that doesn't really like produce any real returns for them? Yeah. So I think, you know, could a PMS that reaches scale, but even that level, like if you look at a guesty or one of my favorite software companies, Breezeway, right? They are moving into other verticals, right? Because maybe there is not a big enough market in short-term rentals alone or vacation rentals to get to that 20, 50, $100 million annual recurring revenue business that you can then have that outcome. You're listening to Slick Talk, the hospitality podcast, a podcast for those who are in and around the hospitality industry who love, live, and breathe what they do. You can join us for candid and unscripted conversations with hospitality experts and founders as we go deeper into their personal stories while they're sharing their triumphs and trials that got them to where they are today. I'm your host, Will Slickers, and you're listening to an episode of Slick Talk, the Hospitality Podcast. Now, let's begin. What's up, Slick Talkers? I want to do dynamic duo sponsorship placements for our partners, and the best dynamic duos I could put together for you are our first one of Hostfully and Minute. Now, you probably heard our Minute with Minute segment with Nathan Smith over at Minute. If I could say Minute a thousand times, then I will. But basically, if you are using Hostfully's property management platform, then you can go to their integration marketplace and turn on your integration with Minute. So that way, everything is operating seamlessly in your hub to run your business without any issues and headaches. It just is so nice to have proper integration partners together. And I couldn't be more thankful for these two partnering with us on the podcast. So make sure you check out the show notes because we have special offers just for you from both companies, Hostfully and Minute, because you're a listener of the podcast and they love taking care of our listeners. So Check out the links in the show notes. And of course, like always, thank you for tuning into the podcast. All right, everybody. This is a special recording because I finally locked in the one and only Arthur Kolker, who is the founder and CEO of StayFi on the podcast once again after three years of not being able to, to have you on the pod. So, Arthur, welcome back. Thanks for having me, Will. So much has of happened course. since we last spoke. I'm excited to, to discuss. I know a lot happens in three years, especially in our industry and the accelerate or not acceleration, acceleration of COVID and what's all happened since. So for all the maybe new listeners of Slick Talk or old listeners who haven't heard your episode, your first episode in a while, let's do a high level overview, cover us a little bit of StayFi, what you do and how you got into the industry. Yeah, so StayFi is a pretty simple product. We took technology you're accustomed to at a coffee shop or a hotel, which is branded Wi-Fi, where we capture guest information, and we brought that to the short-term rental industry. So with StayFi, property managers or vacation rental operators can collect data from every single person staying in their listing, booker, the 10 other friends and family that are there. And then within StayFi, we have a bunch of marketing tools so that you can reach out to these guests and have them book your places directly. And so the whole point of StayFi is to introduce your brand to everyone and get them to come back and stay with you again and again, and over time, reduce your dependence on third-party channels like Airbnb and Verbo. I love it. And you're you're so articulate on making that a high-level short version, unlike some people who ramble on. It's not the first on. time I've done this, so. <laughs> You've been on a lot of podcasts, and that's the the beauty and joy, I think, like, especially doing a little bit of more research outside, like obviously you and I are friends and we hang out at conferences and stuff, but being able to hear what you talk about on other shows, it's really great because now I can pull some information from other sources that you've been on. And so I know with this whole idea, right? Like I came from the hotel world and the Wi-Fi, the branded Wi-Fi was, it was a given, like every hotel I've ever worked at has always had it. It's been a thing. It's like something like, it's like breathing. It's normal. Everyone gets it. It's, 
usual is common with short-term rentals, vacation rentals. It seems to be like this awakening, right? Where people are like, what? I can have branded Wi-Fi, like a hotel or a coffee shop, like you mentioned. And I'm curious to see like, why hasn't there been other people that like realize this? Why is this not a common thing in our, in our space? Well, I'd say the use case between hotels and vacation rentals is very different. Hotels, they want to verify your guest. They sometimes upcharge for faster internet, right? And I think the biggest difference is when you stay at a hotel, you know what brand hotel you're in. And the hotel mm. usually has more, a higher percentage of guest information because most people book hotels for one or two people. And so you probably have at least the booker's email, right? Vacation rentals are weird in the sense that people think they are staying in an Airbnb, which is definitely the most common thing that we hear. Like I booked an Airbnb. Airbnb doesn't really operate any properties. I think they tried to at one point, like test it out they property did. management, and exit that space because it doesn't scale like their other business does, obviously. Yeah. So it's very strange. It would be as if you booked a hotel and you said you stayed at a booking.com. Like it doesn't make any sense, right? Especially now we have property managers that have you know, very specific home types experiences that are offering not just kind of generic listings uh, that may have been more common back in the day. So for us, it's all about highlighting the brand of the different partners we work with, putting that the front and center so we can educate guests about all the wonderful operators we work with and educate that Airbnb is a booking platform, but it's not who controls your experience, which is the most important thing about whether you're going to have a great stay or not. 100%. And I think it's a big mission. It's not an impossible one. But when it comes to actually educating the guests like that, how, I guess, how many times does it take for a guest to book uh, a short term rental, whether they book on Verbo, Airbnb, and then for them to still call it an Airbnb, or if they book direct, I know we have people, we use StayFi at Recreation Rentals, and we have people that are starting to book more directly with some of those properties now. But we still kind of hear either through communication with them or, you know, whatever, like this is such a great Airbnb. And yeah. it's like, oh, I mean, it's like you... Kleenex, right? It's kind of like the name is taken over the category. And it obviously accrues to Airbnb's benefit because the reason they are so successful vis-a-vis -vis their competitors in the space is they have as a share of bookings, most are coming from direct traffic. So people aren't even going through Google as an intermediary. They're going straight to Airbnb.com or using the app, right? So mm -hmm. they own that category name and it's probably not going to change in the near future. So it's just kind of the world that we have to live in. But guests are definitely becoming more savvy about realizing that they can get sometimes a better rate direct. And that's also one huge advantage we have in this vertical over hotels is that hotels, there's much stricter enforcement of rate parity between mm. third-party channels and direct booking sites, which is why often you can't really ever find a disparity between those numbers, or often the third-party channels are actually lower than the direct booking rate. So we also have that advantage, a much bigger pricing advantage, where if we educate guests and they learn about direct bookings, they may find more value just based on price alone, which is a huge area where we can really beat out hotels in that sense. Yeah, I love that. You know, Zach Boozy Cruz, who hosts these, you know, behind the stays podcasts. We we've heard obviously you guys work together and I didn't know I, how you I said heard... his last name, actually. Yeah. Boozy I... Cruz. I I asked him in person, I was like, is it Booza Cruz or Boozy Cruz? He's like Boozy Cruz. I was like, all right, good to know. So all the listeners out there, if you listen to Zach's show and you call him Booza Cruz, it's Boozy Cruz. So we were talking and the one thing that really, I think really sparked a lot of conversation with us on this book direct movement, and I would love your opinion on it, is that companies like Airbnb, Amazon, they all have this amazing feature called one click book or one click shop or whatever the one click It's simple. It's easy. It's fast. I go to my Amazon account. Obviously it's a lot different than booking a short-term rental or a vacation rental. But I slide by now, it knows my address, it has my credit card, and boom, it's bought and it's shipping off to my home within the next day or two. And Airbnb, same thing. You go book on a home that you like, hit book, and it's booked. So your, your credit card, your information is there. Now, book direct, when a guest books with us on our site or if they book with us, you know, whatever direction they go, it's 10 
15, maybe a little bit less if you're lucky, fields that they have to fill out. Name, first and last, credit card, address, email, phone number. Like you have all these fields that you have to book. And the process is just kind of a pain. Hence why I'm sure there's probably a lot of people that go to our direct site, try to book, and they go, uh, nah, I don't want to do that. It's too much work, which is weird because it's not a lot. It's pretty simple, but it is what it is. We're a convenience culture. So when it comes to Book Direct, I'm curious from your point of view and your perspective, especially knowing that you guys have done over 2 million, I think it was 2 million that you guys published stays, right? Within the StayFi existence. Mm-hmm. We've collected almost 2.5 million pieces of information from guests or emails, unique okay. email. So, we've so that's had a lot of data. 2.5 million people interact with StayFi in a short-term rental. So, Well, it's a lot of data to go into, and especially if it's, you know, who knows where they booked from, but I guess my question to you and I'm trying to, to kind of position is, you know, the book direct side is more complicated. It's maybe the booking widgets got a horrible UI UX. Like what do you think it's really going to take for people to really be like, yeah, book direct is like a common, it becomes an Airbnb quote unquote, or the Kleenex where people are comfortable actually making it really simple. Like all the money that's coming to this industry, you would think, that our book direct sites would be easier to use, right? Yeah, I mean, it's really an evolution and depends a lot on what type of property management software you're using and what size you're at and how much you're willing to invest in a high quality website. Because there are great agencies out there like ICD, Boostly, Realtek, who can make the booking experience better than the native white labeled website that most yeah. property management software include. So I'd say, you know, having a booking process with less friction can yield higher conversion rates, right? And it should be something that we're shooting for. I also think this is a typically more considered purchase, especially when you get into the higher end segment than a something you buy on Amazon, right? And a lot of people have a lot of questions. And so being able to directly answer them questions by contacting you through your website versus like a third party site could be beneficial. You also may have a contract or you may upsell travel insurance, right? So there's actually a lot of some additional advantages of having someone come through direct that can actually yield more revenue or, you know, you dictate the terms of cancellation and all that stuff, right? So mm-hmm. having a great experience for booking can also yield upsell opportunities that don't exist through an OTA, right? And not everyone is even comfortable with instant book on OTAs and everybody has their own opinion on how they want to handle that, right? Or through Verbo or whatever. So you know, I think the there's every property manager or owner operator is going to approach it a little differently. But you're definitely right. Like book trick, there's not just one solution that's going to solve your OTA dependent problem, right? It's you need to have a consider what your brand is going to be, your collection and remarketing strategy, then how are you going to build a website that people can convert on and that people trust and has reviews, right? So there's a lot of components to assembling all the things you need to really take off and accelerate, you know, what percentage of bookings you get direct, but there's definitely all the resources out there. And I think it's kind of incumbent on us as an industry to help organize and recommend the right thing for people's stage of business. Cause somebody with, you know, starting a property management business with 10 listings is something very different than an established pay player with 250 luxury homes in Cabo, right? It's like Mm -hmm. they need to do totally different things at those stages of the business. Definitely. And very well said. I'm curious, you know, book direct, OTA dependence. What what do you book on when you travel for conferences or do you try to book direct or what's uh, kind of like your route when you're going to like Verma or we were at, you and I got to hang out at the Travel Nets conference. So like, what do you, what do you I'd say if I'm booking you're... a vacation rental, I will always attempt to book direct and have done that many times in the past. I'd say, especially if I can book with a customer, I always like to do that to go visit in real life. I'd say if I need to book a hotel, then I often will book with OTAs because the price is typically the same and there actually might be additional benefits to booking through an OTA as opposed to booking direct like you know, some reward or loyalty program, right? Um, Or the pricing can often be better through an OTA in the hotel world. So I think it just totally depends on the type of stay. Um, Mm -hmm. But obviously with vacation rentals, 
almost direct is 99% a better option. Yeah. I want to see, you know, maybe you're booking on Airbnb behind the scenes and we just don't, we just don't. Well, a lot of listings, that is the only option, right? Yeah. And that's the only place you can find it. And I try very hard to find it listed elsewhere. And there have been some cases where that was the only option and there were no, uh, for what I needed, no direct option in that area. Right. So that's just the way the cookie crumbles at this point. 100% agree. So I guess, you know, book direct is such a a common thing where everyone goes, you know, okay, they hear book direct, whether you got people like Mark Simpson, who are, you know, shouting it from the rooftops and holding up book direct signs in front of the Airbnb booth at Verma or other stuff like this. And I think a lot of people, especially in the hosting side versus the traditional VRM side, they think of book direct as like, oh, well, I have to like build up a website and do all this stuff and like get away from Airbnb. And having a conversation with Brandy Canale and Michael Golden, my other co-host on our other show, you know, talking about like, if you are a hundred percent just book direct, that's also a little bit of a risk. Like you're kind of, you're setting yourself up for, for failure there too. And having diversification beyond book direct or Airbnb and having a, a diversified portfolio of distribution is important. And so actually being okay with OTA bookings rather than just a hundred percent you know, book direct. And so no, a lot I mean, of people you, hear, yeah, I, I would never, I would not think hundred percent book direct is a desirable or even achievable goal is it would be very challenging, right? Maybe if you had some very unique property and the demand was like out the door, right? Yeah. It doesn't really matter, but you know, there there's having as much demand as possible is what's going to benefit everybody when it comes to occupancy and rates, right? And then you can be strategic and, you know, if I'm going to take an Airbnb booking, it needs to be at X percentage higher than a direct booking, even higher, right? So I think that's where you can start driving the delta. It's not that I'm going to delist, but I'm going to drive prices even higher on these platforms. So if I do get one, they're even more profitable for myself, right? So mm-hmm. that's what I see like Tyann from Brands and Family Retreats is, you know, she substantially upmarks the OTAs because she has a, such a strong direct booking game, but she also doesn't want to lose those bookings right and so that's where kind of like some price discrimination comes into play where it's kind of like what's what are you willing to accept from an ota versus a direct booking and and how much do you mm-hmm. want to potentially start driving up those prices once you have a sustainable kind of direct bookings coming into your website and you kind of know what that looks like in a predictable basis yeah that's a great great example i totally not totally forgot but i remember tying talking about that the book direct show in Miami last year. And that was a great takeaway. I think for a lot of people in the audience, uh, especially of like book directs, great be on the OTAs, but make them pay for it. <laughs> and then, yeah. you know, if they come to you, then great, they get a discount and they probably get a better experience. I love that. So now Arthur going into your guys' story with stay fi, you, your business model isn't just software where a lot of people in our industry on the vendor side, at least are a SaaS or just a pure software product. You actually have hardware involved. And I know we got to talk about this at TravelNet Solutions Conference. And I'm, I'm very curious with within your guys' story, you know, as you scale, like you guys have done some fundraising, you, you've gotten uh, a lot more team members, right? Like I remember it was just you and me at conferences and it would just be you at the booth. I would see you packing stuff and you'd be talking to customers or potential clients and like you've grown a lot. It's been really cool to see the story. And so I guess walk us through this journey as you guys have grown and scaled, like you know, what's it been like for you guys as you've gotten a little bit more, I guess, depth in, into your guys' business and beyond just what was, you know, three years ago? Yeah, I mean, I, Definitely started StayFi as like a side project to my regular job, right? And I think it's just, you know, there's there's not one right way to start or build a business. And there's not, you know, not one formula that's going to work for everybody. But at least for me, like my approach was to bootstrap a very minimal product. Like what was the least amount of things I could build to start selling? And that's kind of the position I started StayFi from. You know, I worked for a lot of businesses in the past that were backed by venture capital firms, and that just wasn't the model for a business that I wanted to build. And I think in our industry, having a VC 
back business is very, very challenging just because of the market size and like what you'd have to do to get an outcome that makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. But I think that's where we've seen a lot of other companies struggle is they raise money from venture capital and then the pressure to grow and expand is so immense. You know, they have to continually pivot and it's very hard to find traction and really get off the ground. And then even once you hit traction, it's like vacation rental vertical is not going to be enough of a market. So you have to kind of pivot and expand to other areas, right? So, you know, that's that's definitely the scary part of taking VC money is you're signing yourself up for a ride that's really out of your control in terms of what you have to return for those investments to make sense. So that just was not the path that I wanted to go down. So for me, it was really about like, how do I build a product that I can sell, start generating revenue? And then when I did need some outside capital, I actually did some what's called crowdfunding. But the objective was really how do I raise money from mostly our customer base? And that way, kind of my investors and my customers are completely aligned in what they would like since they're pretty much overlapping circles. Um, So that was just, you know, the approach that I took which just means that we can really focus on what's going to benefit them, both as investors and customers. And we're not beholden to a more like a VC firm or another outside investor that's looking for something different that it's going to be a lot harder for us to to produce for them. Yeah. So like the WeWork model where it was like scale at all costs, pay triple times the rent or the leasing agreement, right? And just scale, scale, scale and burn through the venture or even Uber is another great example. Yeah, I mean, that... the, what a VC fund is going to do, like if you raise a seed round from a traditional VC fund, it's all about getting to a series A and then it's all about raising more money at higher valuations. And yeah. then it's going to be quickly like your product offering, you know, whether it's if it's not working, you just kind of got to force growth at an unprofitable number or we got to keep pivoting and expand to other verticals or push the organization to a breaking point where it kind of falls apart at a certain point, which Mm -hmm. if you can see, there's been a lot of spectacular collapses. I would say most of the time, though, you know, there's a lot of like PR around a VC raise, like so-and-so raised a $1.5 million seed round, but there's no PR when they shut down or pivot, right? So, you know, it's kind of like a shiny object, but, you know, no one wants to tell like the story of after the fact. Um, Mm -hmm. There was one interesting, I think, I forget which a property management company, but there was one that raised money, I believe, in Latin America. And the founder did write a great piece about shutting it down and how kind of the investment drove them to do irrational and unprofitable things that didn't scale. And then they couldn't get somebody. And then you're dependent on raising another round, right? Yeah. And then diluting yourself as a founder even more. So it can just, you're, you put yourself into situations that are totally outside of your control. So for us, that's not something that I want to do personally, professionally, or how I want to build a business, even mm-hmm. though it can be wildly successful if you do hit it out of the park with that model. So that's really just kind of why we've grown slower, taken on less outside capital, and just been more measured about how we want to build new products and, and bring them uh, into the StateFi platform. Yeah, I love that. And you and I got to kind of geek out a little bit behind the scenes on our pre-chat with you know VC, private equity, bootstrap. You know, we talked about other companies. I think the company you're mentioning out in Latin America was Kasai. And, you know, I got to work with them for a little bit during COVID. And like, they were just like, hey, we're just told to scale and grow and our operations are breaking and I don't know how to fix it. And I was like, I don't know how to fix it either unless you guys slow down. Like there's obviously if your locks aren't working and your door, people can't get into the, you know, the the properties or your guest communication platform that you're building is, is garbage. Like, you know, there's nothing you can do except for fix that because obviously, you know, Without that, you're not going to be running your business. It's yeah, I mean, the property management side VC raising is different in a little way because then they, then you're like building all your tech in house. Yeah, because that's like you want to be valued like a software company, which can also be crazy because there's so much off the shelf tech that is great in this industry, and I see a lot of people actually dispose of their internally built products and buy third party. And then on the software side in the space, right? If you go to every Verma, there are people that come and go every year, and you never Mm -hmm. see them again. And I think that also, you know, I know Guess Who Guide, which is not a VC backed company, but actually incubated within Sharp NEC, which is like a Japanese conglomerate. Yeah. I think that's another interesting case of, you know, someone entering the market with a very cool product, but then, you know, it's risky as a property manager. And I see the hesitancy of like why people sometimes don't want to buy new technology 
because you don't know, like, is it going to be around in a year or two? And what am I going to yeah. do with all these screens? Right. So I think that's that's some, you know, one of the downsides of having a lot of investment coming into the space is kind of like people are hesitant to try things just because there's seems to be new shiny objects and new technology around every year. Yeah, I've implemented a rule into the show that I don't have anyone on as a guest unless they've actually been in operations for a year. Like, I don't care if it's an idea that you've had for a year, like you're not operating. I need you to to actually be because I've had that in the early days of the show where people would be on listeners would love it. They would go to it and then the product or the business goes out in less than a year or so. And you're like, oh, all that promotion and, you know, that that, you know, kind of trust and, and conversation around it for nothing. But, you know what you just mentioned is really important. And I think there's two sides of it, right? Like there's the venture capital side for the software and the tech, and then there's the venture capital side for the property management side. And, you know, I've talked about, you know, 2021, 2022 seemed to be a lot of free money in the market and people were getting funding left and right. I think we were covering it every week. It was like acquisition, funding, acquisition, funding, 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 acquisition. So it was like, okay, like there was a lot of money coming into the space. There's still money coming into the industry. I saw one today at the day of our recording, which is October 31st. You know, uh, Casa Living raised a, a Series B at 70 million. Pretty crazy chunk of change, if I'm yes. being honest. But it slowed down. And so I guess, you know, one of my favorite conversations with, you know, people like Robin Cragen and then even Steve Davis out with Operto uh, talking about, you know, the profitability side and Romy is a great example, right? Like they raised money, but now they're like, Hey, we actually want to just not even have to worry about raising because at the end of the day, we just want to be profitable and we can be profitable with good operations, providing good hospitality. And you said it perfectly is that capital seemed to have been like the shiny object syndrome where everyone was wanting to get press around capital, but then they actually realized it was distracting away from the actual real core of their business. So I guess overall, is there ever an, a sustainable venture model of capital in our industry? Or do you think bootstrapped or private equity and angel investing is maybe the preferable route that actually leads to sustainability as a business? Yeah, I mean, to be a successful VC backed company, you basically need to go public or have like an insane acquisition or exit, you know, in the billion dollar range, right? Because that's what those investors need to make their business model make sense. Since, you know, 95% of their portfolio companies are probably not going to make it. Or are they going to have like kind of like an acquisition that doesn't really like produce any real returns for them? Yeah. So I think, you know, could a PMS that reaches scale, but even that level, like if you look at a guesty or one of my favorite software companies, Breezeway, right? They are moving into other verticals, right? Because maybe there is not a big enough market in short-term rentals alone or vacation rentals to get to that 20, 50, $100 million annual recurring revenue business that you can then have that outcome. And so that's what you have to really think about when you sign up for VC money is, am I going to build an over billion dollar business that's going to have that outcome? And if not, you're probably going to get diluted as a founder so much along the way and then sell that, you know, it's like the people that started Venmo, like it's a public company, not a, well, it's owned by a public company. And we all know the brand, but as founders, they are, you know, they didn't really make any money out of that venture very little. So I think, you know, from a founder perspective, you have to kind of assess, like, is that realistic? And I don't have the ego or like insane view of myself to think that I could build a business like that which I think is some self-awareness you probably need as a founder. <laughs> but then also, like, is my idea, is there enough there and can it grow with a bunch of other services to get there? And I think we see even these companies that are super successful, that have raised venture money, they're having to go to hotels or long-term rentals or whatever it is, right, to, mm -hmm. to reach that outcome, which I think is achievable for them and is fantastic, right? So I'm not going to I don't think it's a bad thing. I just think you got to know what you're getting yourself into and like what's expected from you. Um, and then, you know, there's a bunch of alternative models and, you know, you see companies like Hostaway or Track that have great PE exits and have built yeah. up what is probably a very profitable SaaS business with not a lot of investment. And that's what's really going to kill those type of deals is if you have a bunch of investment 
and you don't own that much and it's owned by a bunch of VC firms, right? So mm-hmm. if you want to have that type of outcome, then you know, a bootstrap lightly funded model is the way to go, which is kind of what our approach has always been. And in that case, there are so many vehicles now to raise money that are not VC. So for us, we did for like where we raised most of our money, we used AngelList and they have something called a roll-up vehicle where you can just get a bunch of individuals who are accredited investors, which in our case is mostly customers, to you know invest anywhere between one or like $50,000 and it gets rolled up into one line item, line item on your cap table using this thing called a safe. So I would say for founders looking to build a business in this space or any other hospitality space, you know, look in, especially if you have some traction or revenue, really explore other options for raising capital that can get you the money you need to achieve your short and midterm object- objectives. And don't only think that the only model is the VC model, because it's definitely not at this point. And there's more options than ever, given some of this called Reg C. There's like new rules around like crowdfunding, whether it's a WeFunder, Republic, using a roll of vehicle that make it you know, a lot more possible to raise money from smaller checks from many people and not make your cap table too convoluted or complex. All right. So you're trying to grow your portfolio and your property management business, but sometimes owners don't have the best peace of mind when it comes to giving up the keys to their home to an unknown brand or company. And of course, let's be honest, sometimes we hear the horror stories of guests and the bad guests that stay in vacation rentals and throw parties. Well, safely as you covered, because not only do they screen your guests that are staying, but they also ensure that you are covered from all things such as ill intent, stupidity, aka vacation brain, and other things like pet damage and theft. While doing that, you are able to partner with Vintory and grow your portfolio with their marketing platform that helps ensure that you are attracting the right owners to your rental program and growing your business in the destination that you are in. Or if you're in multiple destinations, that works too. So get the links in the show notes because both companies have special offers. And if you don't use a link, but you end up talking to them, guess what? Just tell them that Will Slicker sent you from Slick Talk, the hospitality podcast, and they'll get you covered. And you can also let them know that maybe you've heard of them on our platform, hospitality.fm. So of course, like always, make sure you grab the links in the show notes. And thank you guys so much for tuning in to another episode of Slick Talk, the hospitality podcast. Now. Back to the episode, man. There's a lot to unpack from that, and it's yeah. it's it's good though, because like you know, the venture capital. I think in the startup community in general, and not just in our industry, but any startup, anyone that has an idea immediately thinks I need to go to Silicon Valley and I need to, you know, get Google to write a two hundred fifty thousand dollars check, and I need to get X, Y, and Z ventures to write another check and to raise all this money pre product, pre traction, pre anything, and I think. You know, especially in our industry, I don't think you can take real investment or I don't think you should take real investment until you actually have traction and traction can be measured in a lot of different ways. And I think the way you guys did it was the right approach, even though you didn't take the VC route, you still bootstrapped until the point of like, okay, we have a sustainable stream of revenue. We have customers who love the product as they're growing, they're growing with us or they're, you know, implementing us into their growth. And that's sustainable. That's okay. I feel comfortable where I can go raise money. Now, with other who companies- Who do I want to raise with and for what objective, right? So these are all the yeah. questions people need to ask themselves. And I think that, you know, it's there's not one size fits all, right? Yeah. So it just really depends what you want to build. Because some stuff is going to take a lot more capital to invest. And you may need to raise $2 million because what you have an idea you validate but to build the technology at you know the level and scale you want, you may need that. But you know you should shouldn't raise really more than you need at any point. Is kind of what I would urge people to do, because uh, you don't want you know none of these firms, especially VCs, they don't want your cap their money just like sitting around not deployed, right? So <laughs> you got to kind of know what what you're what you want to use it for and why, and have a really good business case around how it's going to work out in the next you know six months or a year or two years or whatever your time frame is. Yeah. And so you've had experience working for companies that were VC backed. So for a lot of you know people in our industry, they're probably coming either from the traditional hotel side like I did, or they're actually, hey, I was a reservationist and then I fell in love with short term rentals and I want to create my own management company or X, Y and Z. I stumbled into vacation rentals by blank. Right. Like that's the common phrase. And so you have experience actually seeing 
the VC side pre industry, a lot of people don't. And so I'm curious, you know, how do people, you know, the, the common, I'm going to back up a little bit just because there's a better way to set this up. But a lot of people get into the space because they love hospitality. They love providing good guest, you know, customer experiences, having the great homes that are beautiful to showcase and like show off. Like this is our, this is our shiny object. And now they have to deal with tech revenue management operation headaches like maintenance and housekeeping and all the craziness happening in our industry with new tech coming in going out x y and z and then they also have to worry about funding and like maybe creating a board or raising cash in some certain you know state there's a lot to manage outside of the one sliver of guest experience hospitality how do you frame or what advice do you have for listeners or founders in our space that are actually just they're not really wanting to go into all this stuff, but they need to, and they want to be educated, but they don't want to leave the core business of operation, operating a hospitable and a five-star experience that's you know sustainable. Yeah. I mean, being a property manager or owner operator is not easy. And there's many, you know, you have to wear a ton of hats. Just like when I started this business, I did literally every function you could imagine. I was set, right. And property manager business is even more extreme because you're dealing with guests all the time that have pressing needs, right? So you're kind of putting out fires while trying to build a process at the same time. And I think that's that's the hardest thing is kind of how do you document and implement, you know, process in your business so that you can handle things more efficiently while you're also putting out all the fires that are happening. And I think the same is true with implementing technology because we see so many people switch PMSs every year. And at a certain point, it's like there is not going to be one perfect software that's going to operate and align 100% with your business and your team. But at some point, it's kind of like, you know, maybe it's more investment into utilizing that tool effectively as opposed to switching constantly, right? And I think the property management software within our industry is kind of where it all starts. And that's typically the first tool we see people acquire. And they may, over the course of their business, change what they're using. Um, but for us, I'd say like when we talk to people, they typically have a PMS. They may have like an operational add-on like a breezeway. And then they typically will have a pricing tool, whether it's embedded in the PMS or they use like, price subs beyond or wheelhouse, definitely the most common ones. And we see that kind of, I think, as kind of like the core pieces of software. And then, you know, how do you build on top of that? And I know locks is another area where, again, I think a lot of people don't know like, do I want to use the kind of thing inside my PMS that's more basic or do I want to go the route of a Lynx or a Point Central? And I know Brooke from Venturi has been doing a very interesting series of posts on LinkedIn with my tech stack. And it's crazy. Like people have, you know, four, some people have 10 and they're all different. And you know, so that's why there's definitely not one set of technology that makes sense for everybody based on your size and team. But there's definitely some mixture that's going to make your life a lot easier. And I think that's part of the secret sauce of building a successful pro property management business is your tech stack and, you know, how it fits into how you run your business. And there's so many options out there for what works. But I definitely would take a look at those posts and to see, like, what are the collection of what folks are using? And I hope he publishes some kind of report so we can see, like, what do most people have and then what's kind of like, things we see emerging and then things that like, you know, may not be used that frequently that we may think are used all the time. So, yeah. Well, yeah, there's, man, there's so much I can go into with that. The, you know, the, there's also a chart that Andrew Kitchell, John on and myself got to make back in the day, I think last year where it's like the ver different verticals of tech and all the tech companies in them. And there's a lot, there's a lot of tech companies in our space. The one, yeah. But the one thing I think is interesting is there's this kind of this like, thought of like, oh, we need something that's like all in one or something that will yeah. do everything. And I'm really not really a fan of that. You know, there's a reason why in our business, you know, we use HubSpot, but then we also mm -hmm. use different softwares for accounting, right? And those yeah. two things like shouldn't be in one platform. And I think it would be dangerous to like give your tech stack to one company that controls your fate because then obviously they can charge you whatever you want. And I think one advantage operators have is the diversity of tech because that's what's going to keep prices low and competition and innovation high. And so I don't think it's a bad thing that people use six things that do six very different things. 
because just because one company is great at one thing doesn't give them any advantage or any particular reason you know what's what's their what's their rationale for owning this other product line that they have no experience in right and didn't mm-hmm. develop over a course of time so i i'm not afraid of i don't think it's a bad thing at all that we use you know i don't think using six different pieces of technology for an operator is a bad thing and it's actually probably a great thing and you should probably be glad it isn't just one or two because then uh, there'll probably be a lot of areas that are lacking underperforming or you're going to be at some point overpaying for it if there's not any competition in the space yeah no i agree with a lot of that the one thing i will kind of maybe push on is that i think it is bad for operators that use too much tech and you know the common phrase of 20 bucking themselves to death where they're using a lot of the same pieces that have some of the core functionality right like you don't that, need to that's have where you, that's where we do see weird things where people are like oh i use x but then i use y which does 80 yeah. percent of x and i like their one thing or yes. like I exactly. use, yeah, there's definitely some like things where there's two softwares used that like have a high level of overlap and there's like one deficiency. Yeah. That's different. But I mean, you know, at a certain scale, like should your CRM and your channel manager be the same tool or different? Does it even matter? I don't think it matters that much if they're the same or different, but having them different is not necessarily a bad thing because you really don't want all your eggs in one basket either. Yeah, hundred uh, percent. That part I agree with a lot. And yeah, the the common thing I was always seeing was like, oh, I have this PMS, but then I also use this other thing that's like a PMS, but I love their inbox. And it's like, your PMS has an inbox. Why are you paying for two? You're 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 blowing my mind right now. You're tw- you're paying a thousand dollars a month for products that basically do the same thing. Not obviously, there's a lot more products that they're using for that thousand dollar bill, but still like there's no point of doing it. like if you're going to use something it's use it well right like learn how it works become a good user of it work with the company to help maybe build it out the features a little bit better like i'm seeing that a lot and you guys are a great example of like hey your customers voice what they want and if it's actually big enough of a a, a thing to build for multiple clients then of course yeah you're going to build it and you're going to do it and it's going to be better but I think a lot of people just like try to grab all these things and they have a thousand dollars or more in tech stacks that they don't need, especially at their size. If they, you know, 15, 20, maybe up to 150 units, they don't need to have two PMSs because they like one inbox better than the other and they use one for 90% of the work. Yeah. I mean, that's where it get a little weird, but I yeah. think, you know, at some point they don't like the locks, their PMS lock solution, go get us, go get the specialty tool, right? Yeah. But there's kind of a reason why there's general tools that may do many things. And then we have specialized tools because in a lot of scenarios, the specialized tool is the only solution that's going to work for you. So I think diversity in tech options is great as a consumer of technology, right? So yes, we'll see a ton of consolidation in our space, but I don't think you want to see too much because then, you know, operators are the one they're going to foot the bill at the end of the day yeah well i have a I have a kind of a closing question for you and this has been a really fun takeaway from vrma for me is that a lot of operators they get sold one thing right when they're getting pitched a new product on on the tech side right and it's not as advertised when they onboard the onboard process is a pain in the ass it takes forever then they actually get onboarded and it's just not working the way that they were told or walk through on their demo and so I face this on a consumer level, not just in our industry. If you buy any piece of tech or product for your home or for just your overall lifestyle and it's not as advertised, it's kind of a bummer. Or like when you order something off of Amazon and it's not how they put on the listing, right? So it's always really frustrating. So for you as a, as a tech founder, not with just software, but with hardware in mind as well, how do you guys make sure and keep to the core of like staying as advertised, right? You you have this core mission of getting people off of OTAs, not off, but less dependence. And you have hardware that goes into it. There's a software in the back end that like helps collect emails and send out email campaigns and do all these other things that are great. And a lot of people not saying this about Stateify, but I just know a lot of operators have always been like, man, I signed up for this one thing and it just wasn't wasn't as it is. And it's really frustrating. Yeah, I mean, the, so how do you guys vapor, like keep that as your core? Yeah. The yeah. vapor problem is huge. And you know, there's definitely, you know, I've seen that problem in our industry of, you know, you get pitched one thing at the conference and then you sign up and it's not that at all, or it's very yeah. different or it breaks and it has tons of bugs and errors of problems. And, you know, that's just because people raise money, they have to get to market and they have to show their investors revenue. And so they're going to 
sometimes take some shortcuts right, and sell the product before mm -hmm. it's right for prime time. Um, and I understand the pressure to do that 100%. It's, it's stressful starting a business and you're trying to hit certain goals. And of course, then that blows back on everyone else because if you're selling a legitimate good and someone's selling vaporware and they're making a bunch of promises they won't keep, they may win that sale. And then that person may come back to you six months later and be, you know, hey, I'm sorry we didn't pick you. And I said, well, you know, we try not to be too negative in that selection process, but it's kind of yeah. like, this is what I said, what would happen or whatever, right? <laughs> so that's a problem in any industry with a lot of emerging technology. You know, so for us, like we don't, you know, we have a lot of confidence in the product, which is why 99% of the time we don't have a contract because I don't need to lock you in for a year. And so if someone's mm -hmm. pressuring you into locking in for a year, and it's not a really good rationale for it, that's a little bit of a red flag or have you talked to other operators that use the product? Did you get referrals to talk to other people? So I think there's a lot of stuff in the buying process that you can do as a consumer of technology to make sure that, especially if it's a your big company, this is a huge decision. It's like, you better go get some references and check with people yeah. that have delivered what is supposed to deliver for them. I think from our end, we're always very cautious in what we promise and, you know, because every location is different. And so just because you went from 10 to 50% book direct in Hawaii, it's going to be different in Nashville and it's going to be different in Pensacola, right? So, you know, there's no way that we can guarantee one set of results. Although we now have a collection of case studies of different type of operators in different areas and what results they achieved over time. And it's also because they marketed well, right? And so there's yeah. some stuff that's also out of our control. So, you know, for me, what I'm really focused on for the next, you know, six months is improving our live support because every home we sell Stayfy into, like 90% of it is the same, but then 10% are like, we're just encountering a lot of edge cases around different Wi-Fi yeah. setups, different home setups, people that want to do different things with email or text marketing that we don't offer today. So for me, it's kind of like we solve 90% of the time initially, and now we like understand how to handle 97% of scenarios. But there's always going to be new edge cases, and it really sucks when you're the edge case. But for me, I'm like always focused on how do we, for the few people that things don't go well, how do we implement the process or even screening to be like, stay is not going to work in your property for X, Y, Z reasons. How do we make sure we're screening and collecting all the information so we can get to 99 plus percent satisfied people because you're never going to be at 100%. And so it's all about how do you continue to refine those edge cases or complex scenarios where we could do a better job of collecting information up front and recommending the appropriate solution for that customer. Dang. Very well said. You have a monthly Very meeting well about that of every single person where like things didn't go swimmingly and we discussed yeah. like what we did wrong, what we should have communicated better, how we should have fixed it, what support we should have offered when. Uh, so for me, it's kind of like we have that laser focus on customer satisfaction and we are trying to solicit proactive feedback from customers all the time because that's the only way you're going to like get the process in place to solve each one of those unique scenarios that may never have happened previously. Definitely. Wow. Very well said. I love that. And it's, it's so good to hear. Cause I, I think like a lot of, again, the, I think the, the word you said vaporware so true and not just in, in hardware or software businesses, but even services businesses. Right. So like you, you promise one, one service and, and yet it's just to get the sale in the door, it's get the credit card done, boom, that's it. And then, Hey, we'll check on you in a year when we need to renew your contract or we need to update your credit card information because you're, and you're, you're, just, and you're just pushing the churn off till later. Right. So it's yeah. kind of like all that stuff comes back to in the end. So even if you think you can pull the wool over someone's eyes, like yeah. you may lock them in for some time, like as a, you better solve their problem ASAP because it's just yeah. going to come back in another metric later and bite you in the ass. So We'll never have 100% customer satisfaction, but it's like we're always trying to improve um, yeah. and get people to be, you know, solve their issues faster and have more documentation and help so that the issues never arise in the first place. Yeah, I love that. That's so good. Well, Arthur, it has been such a, a pleasure to sit down with you and chat once again on the podcast publicly, not just at a conference or anything like that. So thank you so much for being on. And before we let you go, for all of our Slick Talkers listening right now, 
you actually have an opportunity to get 50% off of Stay 5 for your first three months using my code SLICKERS. So, Arthur, thank you for offering all the listeners a great discount. We're going to put everything in the show notes there. But, uh, dude, it's just so great to see what you're building and how you're building it with the intentionality behind it. And, of course, always to, to grab a, a good drink or two at the, the you know, amazing I'll see you at the conferences. Next conference. Yeah, 100%. Thank you so much, Arthur. And for everyone who is listening to the video or the audio and watching the video, make sure you like and subscribe to all things Stay Fi. Make sure you show them some love. Reach out if you have any questions. And of course, we'll see you all again next week. Thank you so much for listening. And thank you to our show partners for making Slick Talk, the hospitality podcast, possible. We hope you enjoyed the show and we would love to connect with you outside of the podcast. So you can follow us on all of our social media channels for daily hospitality content or find us on slicktalkthepodcast.com. And don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe so you never miss an episode. I'm your host, Will Slickers, and we will see you guys all again next week.